going to move ahead to the introductions for chapter 11. And actually the next three chapters, we'll have uh, chapters 11, 12, and 13. And this may be our longest stretch of reading without any interruption for new introductions. So back to the program, what we've got coming up and who we've got coming up. Uh, in chapter 11, uh, Roshi Gregory Abels, a retired actor and director and a Zen master uh, from New York. Uh, then William Nickel, uh, associate professor and chair of the Slavic department at the University of Chicago. Um, and Richard Toth, an actor and writer in New York. Uh, moving ahead to chapter 12, checking in from Canada, uh, Patricia Grant, an actor, uh, and Paul Wilson, a translator, the two of them from Heathcote, Ontario. And uh, moving ahead to chapter 13, Anna Polesny, an artist in Northampton, Massachusetts, and James Monroe Stefko, a dancer and actor in New York. And in the latter part of chapter 13, we will have uh, Lynn Berg, an actor in St. Louis, Missouri, and Mick O'Brien, an actor in New York. And so with that, let me pull down the slides and find Gregory. There he is. Schweik goes with the chaplain to celebrate a drumhead mass. Preparations for the slaughter of mankind have always been made in the name of God or some supposed higher being, which men have devised and created in their own imagination. Before the ancient Phoenicians cut a prisoner's throat, they also performed religious ceremonies just as solemnly as did the new generations some thousand years later before marching to war and destroying the enemies with fire and sword. The cannibals of the Guinea Islands and Polynesia sacrificed to their gods and performed the most diverse religious rites before ceremoniously devouring their captives or unnecessary people like missionaries, travelers, agents of various business firms, or persons who are just inquisitive. As the culture of vestments has not yet reached them, they de decorate the outsides of their thighs with bunches of gaudy feathers of forest birds. Before the Holy Inquisition burnt its victims, it performed the most solemn religious service, a high mass with singing. When criminals are executed, priests always officiate, molesting the delinquents with their presence. In Prussia, the unfortunate victim was led to the block by a pastor. In Austria, to the gallows by a Catholic priest. In France, to the guillotine. In America, to the electric chair by a clergyman. And in Spain, to a chair where he was strangled by an ingenious appliance. In Russia, the revolutionary was taken off by a bearded Orthodox priest, etc. Everywhere on these occasions, they used to march about with a crucified Christ figure, as if to say, they're only cutting your head off. They're only hanging you, strangling you, putting 15,000 volts into you. But think what that chap there had to go through. The great shambles of the World War did not take place without the blessing of priests. Chaplains of all armies prayed and celebrated drumhead masses for victory for the side whose bread they ate. When mutineers were executed, a priest appeared. A priest could also be seen at the execution of Czech legionnaires. Nothing has changed from the time when the robber Wojtek, whom they nicknamed the saint, operated with a sword in one hand and a cross in the other murdering and exterminating the Baltic Slavs. Throughout all Europe, people went to the slaughter like cattle, driven there not only by butcher emperors, kings and other potentates and generals, 
but also by priests of all confessions who blessed them and made them perjure themselves that they would destroy the enemy on land, in the air, on the sea, etc. Drumhead masses were generally celebrated twice, once when a detachment left for the front and once more at the front on the eve of some bloody massacre and carnage. I remember that once when a drumhead mass was being celebrated, an enemy airplane dropped a bomb on us and hit the field altar. There was nothing left of the chaplain except some bloodstained rags. Afterwards, they wrote about him as a martyr. While our airplanes prepared the same kind of glory for the chaplains on the other side. We had a great deal of fun out of this. And on the provisional cross, the spot where they buried the remains of the chaplain, there appeared overnight the epitaph, what may hit us has now hit you. You always said we'd join the saints. Well, now you've caught it at Holy Mass. And where you stood are only stains. Schweik brewed a splendid grog, which eclipsed the grogs of old sea dogs. Pirates of the 18th century might have drunk a grog like that and been satisfied with it. The chaplain was delighted. Where did you learn to make a marvelous thing? He asked. Years ago, as a wandering apprentice, answered Schweik, I, I learned it in Bremen from a debauched sailor who used to say that grog must be so strong that if anyone fell into the sea, he could swim across the whole English Channel. After a week grog, he drowned like a puppy. After a grog like this, Shake, we'll be able to celebrate a marvelous drumhead mass, reflected the captain, ch chaplain. I think I ought to say a few a fa farewell words first. A drumhead mass is not such fun as a mass in the garrison jail or preaching to those rascals. You have to have all your wits about you. We'll have a field altar. It's a folding one, a pocket edition. Jesus Maria Schweik, he cried, holding his head in his hands. We're bloody idiots. Do you know where I used to keep that folding altar? In the sofa we sold. Oh dear, that's really a misfortune, sir, said Schweik. As a matter of fact, I know that furniture dealer. And the other day before yesterday, the day before yesterday, I met his wife. He's in jug because of a stolen wardrobe. And a teacher in Versha, they'd say, has got our sofa. It's going to be a disaster if we don't have that field altar. The best thing we could do is drink up the grog and go and look for it. Because I think that without a field altar, you can't celebrate a mass. A field altar is the only thing that's missing, said the chaplain in a melancholy voice. Everything's ready on the parade ground. The carpenters have already made a platform for it. The monstrances are being lent to us from Brejvnav Monastery. I ought to have a chalice of my own. But where is it? He reflected, suppose I've lost it. Then we'll get a sports cup from Attendant Vitiger of the 75th Regiment. Years ago, he ran in races and won it for sport favorite. He used to be a good runner. He did uh, from Vienna to Mödling in one hour, 48 minutes, as he always boasted about it. I arranged this with him already yesterday. I'm a bloody fool leaving everything to the last minute. Why didn't I look inside that sofa? Bloody ass. And now with pleasure, I turn it over to William Nickel in Chicago. Under the influence of the grog, prepared after the recipe of the debauched sailor, he began torpidly to swear at himself and explained in the most diverse maxims where he really belonged. Well, we better go and have a look for that field altar, suggested Shveik. It's already daybreak. I still have to put on my uniform and drink another grog. 
At last they went out. On their way to the wife of the furniture dealer, the chaplain told Schweik that the day before he had won a lot of money gambling at God's blessing, and that if all went well, he'd buy the piano back from the pawnbroker. It was rather like when heathens promise to bury an offering. From the sleepy wife of the furniture dealer, they learnt the address of the teacher in Vershevitsa, the new owner of the sofa. The chaplain display, displayed unusual generosity. He pinched her cheek and tickled her under her chin. They went to Vershevitsa on foot, as the chaplain avowed that he must have a turn in the fresh air to distract his thoughts. An unpleasant surprise awaited them in the apartment of the teacher at Vershevitsa who was a pious old gentleman. Finding the field altar in the sofa, the old gentleman had thought that this must be some divine dispensation and had given it to the vestry of the local church in Vershevitsa, stipulating that on the other side of the folding altar, there should be the inscription, presented for the honor and praise of God by Mr. Kolarik, retired teacher in the year of our Lord, 1914. He displayed great embarrassment because they came on him in his underclothes. From their conversation with him, it was clear that he attributed to the discovery the significance of a miracle and a divine direction. He said that when he bought the sofa, an inner voice said to him, look at what's in the drawer of the sofa. He claimed he also had a vision of an angel who gave him the direct command, open the drawer of the sofa. He obeyed. And when he saw the miniature folding altar in three sections with a recess for a tabernacle, he had knelt down in front of the sofa and prayed long and fervently and praised God. Regarding it as a direction from heaven, he adorned the church and Vershavitsa with it. We don't think this is at all funny, said the chaplain. An object of this kind which didn't belong to you, you should at once have taken to the police and not to any blasted vestry. Because of that miracle at its fake, you may face a lot of trouble. You bought a sofa and not the altar, which belongs to the army authorities. A divine dispensation like that can cost you dear. You ought not to have paid any attention to the angels. There was a man in shore who dug up a chalice in the field and it had been stolen from a church and kept there for better times until it was forgotten. He also took it as a divine dispensation. Instead of melting it down, went to the vicar with it and said he wanted to present it to the church. The vicar thought that he'd been moved by pangs of conscience and sent for the mayor. The mayor sent for the gendarmerie, and though he was innocent, he was sentenced for stealing church property just because he kept on babbling about some miracle. He wanted to defend himself and also talked about an angel, but he mixed the Virgin Mary into it and got 10 years. You do best to come with us to the local vicar here and get him to return us the army property. A field altar isn't a cat or a sock that you can give away to anyone you like. The old gentleman trembled all over and his teeth chattered as he put on his clothes. I, I really meant no harm. I just thought it, with a divine dispensation like that, I could use it for the adornment of our poor church of our Lord in Vershevitsa. At the expense of the army authorities, no doubt, Shvik said sternly and harshly. Thank God for a divine dispensation like that. A fellow called Pivenko of Hortebor also thought it was a divine dispensation when a halter with someone else's cow in it got into his hand by accident. The poor old gentleman was quite confused by these remarks and made no further attempts to defend himself, trying to dress as quickly as possible and settle the whole business. The vicar at Vershevitsa was still asleep when he was awoken, and when he was awoken by the noise started to swear because in his drowsiness, he thought he had to go and administer the last rites to somebody. And I shouldn't bother people with this extreme unction, he growled, dressing himself unwillingly. People take it into their heads to die when a chap's having a really good sleep. And afterwards, you have to haggle with them about the fee. And so they met in the hall, one the representative of the Lord for the Catholic civilians of Vershevitsa, the other the representative of God on earth for the military authorities. Altogether, however, it was nothing more than a dispute between a civilian and a soldier. When the vicar asserted that the field altar did not belong to the sofa, the chaplain declared that in that case it belonged all the less to the vestry of a church, which was attended only by civilians. Schweik made various remarks to the effect that it was an easy job to fit up a poor church at the expense of the army authorities, 
he pronounced the word poor in inver inverted commas. Finally, they went to the vestry of the church, and the vicar handed over the field altar in return for the following receipt. Received a field altar which accidentally found its way into the church at Varsovica, chaplain Otto Katz. And now I turn it over to actor and writer Richard Toth in New York. The famous field altar came from the Jewish firm of Moritz Mahler in Vienna, which manufactured all kinds of accessories for mass, as well as religious objects like rosaries and images of saints. The altar was made up of three parts, liberally provided with sham gilt, like the whole glory of the Holy Church. It was, not, it was not possible without considerable ingenuity to detect what the pictures painted on these three parts actually represented. What was certain was that it was an altar which could have been used equally well by heathens in Zambesi or by the shamans of the Buryats and Mongols. Painted in screaming colors, it appeared from a distance like a colored chart intended for testing colorblind railway workers. One figure stood out prominently a naked man with a halo and a body which was turning green, like the parson's nose of a goose which has begun to rot and is already stinking. No one was doing anything to this saint. On the contrary, he had on both sides of him two winged creatures which were supposed to represent angels, but anyone looking at them had the impression that this holy naked man was shrieking with horror at the company around him, for the angels looked like fairy tale monsters and were a cross between a winged wild cat and the beast of the apocalypse. Opposite this was a picture which was meant to represent the Holy Trinity. By and large, the painter had been unable to ruin the dove. He had painted a kind of bird which could equally well have been a pigeon or a white Wyandotte. God the Father looked like a bandit from the Wild West, served up to the public in an American film thriller. The son of God, on the other hand, was a gay young man with a handsome stomach draped in something that looked like bathing drawers. Altogether, he looked a sporting type. The cross, which he had in his hand, he held as elegantly as if it had been a tennis racket. Seen from afar, however, all these details ran into each other and gave the impression of a train going into a station. What the third picture represented was quite impossible to make out. The soldiers always argued about it and tried to solve the enigma. One even thought that it was a landscape from the Sazava Valley. But underneath it was the inscription in German, Holy Mary, Mother of God, have mercy on us. Schweik deposited the field altar safely in the droshki and seated himself next to the driver in the box. The chaplain made himself comfortable inside the droshki with his feet on the Holy Trinity. Schweik chatted with the driver about the war. The driver was a rebel. He made various remarks about the victory of the Austrian forces, such as, they made it hot for you in Serbia, etc. When they crossed the customs point, the official asked them what they were taking with them. Schweik answered, the Holy Trinity and the Virgin Mary together with the chaplain. Meanwhile, on the parade ground, the march detachments were waiting impatiently, and they had waited a long time, for they had had to fetch the sports cup from Lieutenant Wittinger and then the monstrance, the picks, and other accessories of the mass, including a bottle of sacramental wine from the Brevnov Monastery. From this, one may conclude that it is no simple matter to celebrate a drumhead mass. We muddle along as we can, said Schweik to the driver, and he was right. For when they reached the drill ground and were at the platform with the wooden framework and table on which the field altar was to be placed, it turned out that the chaplain had forgotten the server. Before, it had always been an, inf an infantryman who served, but he had preferred to get himself transferred to telephones and had gone to the front. Never mind, sir, said Schweik. I can manage that too. But you can't serve? I've never done it, answered Schweik, but there's no harm in having a shot. Today, there's a war on, and in wartime, people do things which they never dreamed of doing before. I'll manage to cope with that stupid et cum spiritu tuo to your dominus gobiscum. And I think it's not very difficult to walk around you like a cat round hot porridge and wash your hands and pour wine out of the flask. All, all right, said the chaplain, but don't go and pour me out any water. 
you know, better to put wine in the other flask too. As to the rest, I'll always tell you whether you have to go to the right or to the left. If I whistle once very softly, that means go to the right. Twice means to the left. And you don't need to drag the missile about much. It's great fun, really. Got stage fright? I'm not frightened of anything, sir, not even of serving. The chaplain was right when he said, it's great fun, really. Everything went like a house on fire. The chaplain's address was very brief. Soldiers, we have met here so that before we go to the battlefield, we may incline our hearts to God, that he may grant us victory and keep us safe and sound. I won't detain you long and wish you all the best. Stand at ease, shouted an old colonel on the left flank. A drumhead mass is called a drumhead mass because it comes under the same rules as military tactics in the field. During the long maneuvers of the armies in the Thirty Years' War, drumhead masses were apt to be extremely lengthy too. In modern tactics, where the movements of armies are rapid and brisk, drumhead masses must be equally rapid and brisk. And so this one lasted exactly 10 minutes and those who were close by wondered very much why the chaplain whistled during it. Schweik mastered, quickly mastered the signals. Now he walked to the right of the altar and now he was on the left and he said nothing else but et cum spiritu tuo. It looked like a red Indian dance around a sacrificial stone, but it made a good impression for it banished the boredom of the dusty melancholy drill ground with its avenue of plum trees behind and its latrines, the odor of which replaced the mystical scent of incense in Gothic churches. Everyone enjoyed themselves immensely. The officers standing around the colonel were cracking jokes with each other, and so everything was as it should be. Here and there, among the ranks and file, could be heard the words, give me a puff. And from the companies, blue clouds of tobacco smoke rose to heaven as from a burnt offering. All the NCOs started smoking when they saw that the colonel himself had lit a cigarette. At last, the words, let us pray, were heard. There was a whirl of dust and a gray rectangle of uniforms bowed their knees before Lieutenant Wittinger's sports cup, which he won for a sport favorite in the Vienna moodling race. The cup was filled full and the general opinion in the ranks of the chaplain's manipulations was, he swilled it all right. This performance was repeated twice. After that, once more, let us pray, whereupon the band did its best with the Austrian national anthem. Then came attention and quick march. Collect all this stuff, said the chaplain to Schweik, pointing to the field altar, so that we can take it back where it belongs. So they drove off with their droshky, returned everything like good boys, except for the bottle of sacramental wine. And when they were home again and had the unfortunate droshky driver, and had told the unfortunate droshky driver to apply to the regimental command for payment for the long drive, Schweik said to the chaplain, Humbly report, sir. Must a server be of the same confession as the man he's assisting? Well, of course, said the chaplain. Otherwise, the mass wouldn't be valid. Then, sir, a great mistake has been made, said Schweik. I'm a man without confession. It's always me that has the bad luck. The chaplain looked at Schweik, was silent for a moment, then patted him on the shoulder and said, you can drink up what's left in the bottle of sacramental wine and imagine that you've been taken back into the bosom of the church. I would now like to pass it on to Patricia Grant and Paul Wilson in Heathcote, Ontario, Canada. Thank you so much, Richard. We would also like to pass it on to Patricia and Paul in Ontario, uh, but they have not yet joined our crew. Uh, so we're going to have our pinch hitters step in. Uh, and so uh, in lieu of Patricia Grant reading the first part of chapter 12 is our own Vera Dvozak from Brooklyn, New York. And she will be followed if Paul does not appear uh, by our own Vit uh, whom you have seen earlier today. Uh, so Vera, the floor is yours. Oops. Thank you. A religious debate. It happened that for whole days at a time, Schweik never saw the man who had the cure of army souls. The chaplain divided his time between duties and debauchery and came home very rarely. 
when he did, he was filthy and unwashed like a meowing tomcat when it makes its amorous expeditions on the tiles. When he came back, if he was able to express himself at all, he talked to Schweik for a bit before falling asleep. He spoke of lofty aim, inspiration, and the pleasure of meditation. Sometimes, too, he tried to speak in verse and quoted Heine. Schweik and the chaplain celebrated one more drumhead mass for the sappers, to which another chaplain had been invited by mistake, a former catechist. He was an extraordinarily pious man who stared at his colleague in amazement when he offered him a sip of cognac out of the field flask, which Schweik always carried with him for religious functions of this kind. It's a good brand, said Chaplain Katz. Have a drink and go home. I'll do the job myself because I need to be in the open air. I've got a bit of a headache. The pierced chaplain went away shaking his head and as usual Katz acquitted himself nobly of his task. This time it was wine and soda water which was transubstantiated in the blood of our Lord and the sermon was longer every third word being, and so forth, and of course. Today, my man, you are going to the front, and so forth. Incline your hearts now to God, and so forth, and of course. You don't know what's going to happen to you, and so forth, and of course. And from the altar there continue to thunder, and so forth, and of course, alternating with God and all the saints. In his enthusiasm and rhetorical flights, the chaplain presented Prince Eugene of Savoy as a saint who would protect them when they built bridges over the rivers. Nonetheless, the drumhead mass ended without any untoward incident. It was pleasant and amusing. The sappers enjoyed themselves very much. On the way back, the chaplain and Schweik were not allowed into the tram with their folding field altar. I'll break this saint on your head, Schweik said to the conductor. When they finally got home, they found that somewhere on the way they had lost the tabernacle. It doesn't matter, said Schweik. The early Christians served holy mass without a tabernacle. If we advertised for it somewhere, the honest man who found it could ask us for a reward. If it had been money, then I don't suppose any honest finder would have been found, although such people do exist. In our regiment at Budějovice, there was a soldier, a dear old fat head, who once found 600 crowns in the street and gave it up to the police. In the newspapers, they wrote about him as an honest finder, but it only brought discredit on him. No one would talk to him. Everyone said, you half-wit, what's this bloody nonsense you've done? Why, you must be quite disgusted with yourself if you've still any sense of honor left. He had a girl and she wouldn't speak to him anymore. When he came home on leave, his friends threw him out of the pub during a dance party because of it. He got ill and took it all so much to heart that he finally threw himself under a train. And then again, in our street, there was a tailor who found a golden ring. People warned him not to give it up to the police, but he wouldn't listen. He got an unusually kind reception there and was told that the loss of a golden ring with a diamond had already been notified to them. But then they looked at the stone and said to him, My good man, you know very well that it's glass and not diamond. How much did they give you for the diamond? We know very well your kind of honest finder. In the end, it came out that another man had lost a gold ring with a false diamond, a kind of family heirloom, but the tailor sat three days in prison all the same because he got head up and insulted a policeman. He was given the legal reward of 10%, which was one crown, 20 hollers, because that trash was worth 12 crowns, but he threw it in the gentleman's face. The gentleman then sued him for insulting his honor, so he got another 10 crowns fine. Afterwards, he used to say everywhere that every honest finder deserves 25 strokes. Let them flog him black and blue, flog him publicly, so that people should remember and take a lesson from it. 
I don't think that anyone will bring our tabernacle back, even though it has the regimental crest on the back, because no one wants to have anything to do with army property. They'd rather throw it in the water somewhere so as not to have further complications with it. Yesterday at the pub, the Golden Wreath, I spoke to a man from the country. He was 56 and was going to the office of the district hetman in Novapaka to ask why they had requisitioned his carriage. On the way back, when they had thrown him out of hetman's office, he had a look at the baggage train which had just come in and was standing on the square. A young man asked him to wait a moment by the horses which were to fetch tinned goods for the army and then he never came back. When the baggage train moved off, this chap had to go with them and found himself in Hungary, where he in his turn asked someone to wait by the baggage train in his place. It was only in this way that he saved himself, otherwise they'd have dragged him off to Serbia. When he arrived he looked absolutely terrified and would never have anything to do with army property anymore. In the evening they received a visit from the pious chaplain who had wanted to serve the drumhead mass for the sappers that morning. He was a fanatic who wanted to bring everyone close to God. When he had been a catechist he had developed religious feelings in children by slapping their faces and there had appeared from time to time in various journals articles about the sadistic catechist, the slapping catechist. He was convinced that a child learns the catechism best with the help of the birch. He limped a little on one foot, which had been caused by a visit made to him by the father of one of his pupils, whose face he had slept for having expressed certain doubts about the Holy Trinity. He got three slaps on the face himself, one for God the Father, a second for God the Son, and a third for the Holy Ghost. Today he had come to lead his colleague Katz on to the right path and to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him. He began it with the remark, I'm surprised that you've got no crucifix hanging here. Where do you say your breviary prayers? And there's not a single portrait of the saints on the walls of your room. What's that hanging over your bed? Katz smiled. Dead Susanna and the elders and that naked woman underneath is an old friend of mine. On the right there's something Japanese depicting the sexual act between a geisha and an old Japanese samurai. Very original, isn't it? The breviary is in the kitchen. Schweik, bring it here and open it on the third page. Schweik went away and from the kitchen could be heard the sound of corks being drawn from three bottles of wine and I pass my torch to Vit Hotesh, if I'm not mistaken, right? The pious chaplain was aghast when the three bottles made their appearance on the table. It's a light sacramental wine, brother, said Katz, of very good quality, a Riesling, it tastes like Moselle. I'm not going to drink, said the pious chaplain stubbornly. I've come to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you. That'll dry up your throat, my dear colleague, said Katz. Have a drink and I'll listen. I'm a very tolerant fellow and I can listen to other views. The pious chaplain drank a little and rolled his eyes. It's a devilish good wine, my dear colleague, isn't it? The fanatic said sternly, it has not escaped me that you are swearing. That's habit, answered Katz. Sometimes I even catch myself blaspheming. Pour the chaplain out some more, Schweik. I can assure you that I also say him, Herrgott, crucifix and sacra. I think when, that when you served in the army as long as I have, you'll find yourself doing it too. It 
it isn't at all difficult or complicated, and it's very familiar to us clergy. Heaven, God, the cross, and the holy sacrament. Doesn't that sound marvelously professional? Drink a bit more, my dear colleague. The former catechist sipped mechanically. It was obvious that he wanted to say something, but could not. Um, and I lost my spot because they're texting me from the main office, but could not. He was collecting his thoughts. My dear colleague, continued Katz, cheer up. Don't sit there so miserably as though they were going to hang you in five minutes' time. I've heard about you. Once on a Friday, by mistake, you ate a pork cutlet in a restaurant because you thought that it was Thursday. And how you stuck your finger down your throat in the WC or as the latrine to get rid of it because you thought God would obliterate you. I'm not afraid of eating meat in Lent, and I'm not afraid of hellfire either. Excuse me, please go on drinking. Are you better now? Or do you have progressive views about hell and keep up with the spirit of the times and the reformists? I mean, instead of ordinary call. Is he here? And I will bring Paul front and center. Just a minute, I got to get my, my script here. Okay, 3940, got it. Okay, the pious chaplain was aghast when the three bottles made their appearance on the table. It's a light sacramental wine, brother, said Katz. A very good quality, a Riesling. It tastes like Mademoiselle. I'm not going to drink, said the pious chaplain stubbornly. I've come to have a heart to heart talk with you. That'll dry up your throat, dear Conrad, your dear colleague, said Katz. Have a drink and I'll listen. I'm a very tolerant fellow and I could listen to other views. The pious chaplain drank a little and rolled his eyes. It's a hell of a good wine, my dear colleague, isn't it? It has not escaped me that you are swearing, said the fanatic sternly. That's a habit, answered Katz. Sometimes I even catch myself blaspheming. Pour the chaplain out some more. Shrek, I can assure you that I also say Himmel, Hergot, Crucifix, and Sacra. I think that when you serve the army as long as I have, you'll find yourself doing it too. It isn't at all difficult or complicated and it's very familiar to us clergy. Heaven, God, the cross, the holy sacrament. Doesn't that sound marvelously ecclesiastical? Drink a bit more, my dear colleague. The former catechist sipped, sipped mechanically. It was obvious that he wanted to say something but could not. He was collecting his thoughts. My dear colleague, continued Katz, cheer up. Don't sit there so miserably as though they were going to hang you in five minutes time. I heard about you, about how once on a Friday you ate pork cru uh, cutlet in a restaurant by mistake because you thought it was Thursday and how you stuck your finger down your throat in the WC to get rid of it because you thought God would obliterate you. I'm not afraid of eating meat in Lent and I'm not afraid of hellfire either. Excuse me, please go on drinking. Are you better now? Or do you have progressive views about hell and keep up with the spirit of the times of the ref reformists? I mean, instead of ordinary cauldrons with sulfur for poor sinners, there are papin's pots and high pressure boilers. The sinners are fried in margarine. There are grills driven by electricity, steamrollers, roller gears. The gnashing of, of the teeth is produced with the help of dentists with special equipment. The howling is recorded on gramophones and the records are sent upstairs to paradise for entertainment of the just. In paradise, sprays with eau de cologne operate and the Philharmonic Orchestra plays Brahms so long that you would rather be in hell or purgatory. The cherubs have airplane propellers on their behind so as not to have to work hard with their wings. Drink, my dear colleague, Shvake, pour him out some cognac. I don't think he's feeling well. When the pious chaplain came round, he started to whisper, religion is a matter of rational reasoning. Whoever does not believe in the existence of the Holy Trinity, Shrek, Katz interrupted him, pour out some more cognac so as to bring him around. Tell me something, Shrek. Tell him something, Shrek. 
humbly reports, sir, said Shrek, near Vlashim, there was a dean who had a charwoman. And when the old housekeeper ran away from him with the boy and the money, and this dean in his declining years started studying St. Augustine, who is said to be one of the Holy Fathers. And he read that whoever believes in the Antipodes will be damned. And so he called his charwoman and said to her, listen, you once told me that your son was a fitter and that he went to Australia. That would be in the Antipodes. And according to St. Augustine's instructions, everyone who believes in the Antipodes is damned. Oh, reverend sir, the woman answered. After all, my son sends me letters and money from Australia. Ah, that's the snare of the devil, replied the dean. According to St. Augustine, Australia doesn't exist at all and you are just being seduced by the Antichrist. On Sunday, he anathematized her publicly and shouted out that Australia didn't exist. So they took him straight out of the church and into the lunatic asylum. More people like him ought to be put there. In the convent of the Sisters of St. Ursula, they have a bottle of the Holy Virgin's milk with which she suckled the baby Jesus. And in the orphanage at Beneshoff, after they brought him water from Lourdes, the orphans got diarrhea, the likes of which the world has never seen. Black spots were dancing in front of the pious chaplain's eyes, and he only came to himself after another cognac, which went straight to his head. Blinking his eyes, he asked Katz, don't you believe in the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary? Don't you believe that the thumb of St. John the Baptist, which is preserved in the Pierce Monastery, is genuine? Do you believe in the Lord at all? And if you don't, why are you a chaplain? <laughs> My dear colleague, answered Katz, patting him familiarly on the back, until the state recognizes that soldiers who are going to their death at the front don't need the blessing of God for it, the chaplaincy remains a decently paid profession. Where a chap isn't overworked, it was better for me than running about on a drill ground and getting, uh, going on maneuvers. Then I used to get orders from my superiors. But now I do what I like. I represent someone who doesn't exist. And I myself play the part of God. If I don't want to absolve anyone's sins, then I don't, even if they beg me on their bended knees. But you'd find bloody few people nowadays who'd go that far. I, I love God, declared the pious chaplain, beginning to hiccup. I, I, I know I'm very, I love him very much. Give me a little wine. I respect God, he continued. I respect and honor him very much. I respect no one so much as I, as I respect him. He struck the table with his fist until the bottles jump. God is an exalted being, something unearthly. He's honorable in his dealings. He's a radiant revelation and no one is gonna convince me of the contrary. I respect St. Joseph too. I respect all saints except St. Scrapian. Scrapian, he's got such an ugly name. You ought to have a change, observed Strake. I love St. Ludmilla and St. Bernard, continued the former catechist. He saved many pilgrims in St. Gotthard. He carries a bottle of cognac around his neck and he looks for people caught in snowdrifts. <laughs> the conversation took a new turn. The pious chaplain started getting completely muddled. I honor the innocents. They have their saints day on the, the 28th of December. I hate Herod. And when the hens sleep, you can't get any new laid eggs. He gave a guffaw and began to sing, holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth. He broke off at once and turning to Katz and getting up, asked him sharply, you don't believe in the 15th, that the 15th of August is the day of the assumption of the Virgin Mary? The fun was in full swing. More bottles appeared, and from time to time, cats could be heard saying, say that you don't believe in God, otherwise I won't let you have a drop. It was as though the times of the persecution of the early Christians had returned. The former catechist sang a song of the martyrs of the Roman arena and yelled out, I believe in God, I won't forswear him, you can keep your wine, I can send for some myself. Finally, they put him to bed. Before he fell asleep, he proclaimed, raising his right hand in a solemn oath, I believe in God the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Bring me the breviary. Shrake put into his hand a book which was lying on the night table. The pious chaplain 
then fell asleep with, with Boccaccio's Decameron in his hand. I apologize for the, uh, the screw up. I'm technically uh, a peasant, uh, but I would like to now pass the baton to Anna uh, Polosny in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. Faith administers extreme unction. Chaplain Otto Katz sat glumly over a circular which he had just brought from the barracks. It contained secret instructions from the war ministry. For the duration of the war, the war ministry suspends all operative regulations concerning the administration of extreme unction to soldiers of the army and lays down the following regulations for army chaplains. One, at the front, extreme unction is canceled. Two, those who are seriously ill and wounded are forbidden to go back to the base for extreme unction. Army chaplains are required at once to hand over such cases to the appropriate military authorities for further action. Three, in army hospitals at the base, extreme unction can be administered en masse on the basis of a certificate from the army doctors provided it does not entail difficulties for the appropriate military institutions. Four, in exceptional cases, the military hospital's command at the base may allow individuals to receive extreme unction. Five, army chaplains are obliged if called on by the military hospital's command to administer extreme unction to those designated by the command. After that, the chaplain read once more the order informing him that the next day he must go to the army hospital at Charles Square to administer extreme unction to the seriously wounded. Listen, Schweik, the chaplain called out. Isn't this a bloody nuisance? Just as if I was the only chaplain in the whole of Prague. Why, why don't they send that pious priest who slept here the other day? We've got to go and administer it at Charles Square. I've already forgotten how to do it. Then we'll buy a catechism, sir. It'll be there, said Schweik. It's a kind of Baedeker for spiritual pastors. In the Emmaus Monastery, a gardener's assistant who worked there once wanted to join the ranks of the lay brothers and get a cowl so as not to tear his clothes. He had to buy a catechism and learn how to make the sign of the cross. Who alone is preserved from original sin? What it means to have a clean conscience and other trifles like that. And after that, he secretly flogged half the cucumbers from the monastery garden and left the monastery in grace, in disgrace. When I met him, he said, I could have flogged those cucumbers just as well without the catechism. When Schweik brought the catechism, which he had purchased, the chaplain turned the pages in it and said, look, extreme unction can only be administered by a priest and then only with the oil which has been consecrated by a bishop. So you see, Schweik, you yourself can't administer extreme unction. Read out to see how one does it. Schweik read out, it's done like this. The priest anoints the sick man on all his senses at the same time praying as follows. By his holy unction and his holy mercy, may God forgive thee for all the sins thou hast committed through thine eyes, thine ears, thy smell, thy taste, thy words, thy touch and thy gait. I'd like to know, said the chaplain, how a man can sin with his touch. Can you tell me? In lots of ways, sir. You can put your hands in someone else's pocket or on the dance floor. Well, you know how that goes there. And by his gait, Schweik, when he begins to limp so as to arouse people's pity. And by his smell, when he doesn't like stink or stinkers. And his taste, Schweik when he has a taste for somebody. And his words, that goes together with ears, when someone chatters a lot and someone else listens to him. After these philosophical reflections, the chaplain was silent and said, and so we need oil consecrated by a bishop. Here's 10 crowns, go and buy a bottle. Obviously they won't have this kind of oil at the military stores. Schweik set out on his journey in search of oil, which had been consecrated by a bishop. 
This errand was more difficult than looking for the water of life in Bojanan Nemsova's fairy tales. He went into various chemists and as soon as he said, please, I want a bottle of oil consecrated by a bishop, they either burst out laughing or hid in a panic under the counter. All this time, Sveik's countenance was unusually solemn. And so he decided to try his luck at surgeries. In the first, they had him thrown out by a dispenser. In the second, they wanted to telephone for an ambulance. And in the third, the head of the surgery said that Bullock's Limited in Gloha Avenue, a firm dealing in oil and lacquers, would certainly have in stock the oil he wanted. Bullock's Limited in Loja Avenue was a very efficient firm. They never let a customer go without satisfying his requirements. If he wanted copaiba balsam, they poured out turpentine for him and that did just as well. When Schweik came in and asked for 10 crowns worth of oil consecrated by a bishop, the manager said to the assistant, pour him out a gill of hemp seed oil number three, Mr. Tauchen. And the assistant, wrapping the bottle up in paper, said to Schweik in a completely businesslike way, it's of the finest quality. If you would like a paintbrush, lacquer, or varnish, don't hesitate to apply to us. We, ser we shall serve you reliably. In the meantime, the chaplain was learning up again in the catechism what he had forgotten from his time at the cemetery. He enjoyed very much some unusually witty sentences which made him laugh heartily. The name extreme unction or last unction derives from the fact that this unction is usually the last of all the unctions with the church administers to anyone. Or extreme unction may be received by every Catholic Christian who is seriously ill and has at least come at last come to his senses. The patient is to receive extreme unction if possible while his memory still holds. Then an orderly came with a packet in which the chaplain was informed that the next day extreme unction would be attended by the Association of Gentlewomen of the Religious Education of the Troops. This association consisted of hysterical old women who distributed to the soldiers in the hospitals icons of saints and stories about a Catholic warrior dying for his imperial majesty. These stories had a colored illustration of a battlefield. They were lying about everywhere, human corpses and horse carcasses, overturned munitions trains and gun carriages. On the horizon, villages were burning and shrapnel bursting. In the foreground lay a dying soldier with his leg torn off. An angel was bending over him and bringing him a wreath with the inscription on the ribbon, this very day you will be with me in paradise and the dying man was smiling blissfully as though they were bringing him an ice cream cone. When Otto Katz had read the contents of the packet, he spat and reflected, tomorrow is going to be some day. He knew the harpies as he called them from the Church of St. Ignatius, where years ago he used to preach to the troops. At that time, he used to put a lot of feeling into his sermons and the association used to sit behind the colonel. Two tall and skinny women in black dresses with rosaries once came up to him after the sermon and talked to him for two hours about the religious education of the troops until he got angry and said to me, said to them, excuse me, my good ladies, the captain's expecting me for a game of farble. And while he's going to the game, uh, James Monroe Stevko in New York City, actor and dancer, will continue the story. And so here's the oil, said Schweik solemnly when he returned from Pollock's Limited. Hemp seed oil number three, finest quality. We can anoint a whole battalion with it. The firm is a reliable one. It sells varnish, lacquer, and brushes as well. Now we only need a bell. Why a bell, Schweik? We have to ring it on the way so that people take their hats off to us when we transport the Lord, sir, with his hemp seed oil number three. It's always done. And very many people to whom it meant nothing have been put in jail because they didn't take their hats off. On a similar occasion in Zhishkov, a vicar once beat a blind man because he didn't take his hat off and he was put in jail too. Because they proved to him before the courts that he was 
not deaf and dumb, but only blind, and that he had heard the ringing of the bell and caused a scandal, although it was at nighttime. That's just like at Corpus Christi. At another time, people would never look at us, but now they'll take their hats off to us. If you don't mind, sir, I'll fetch it at once. Having obtained permission, Shveik produced a bell in half an hour. It's from the door of the roadside inn, Ukrishku, he said. It cost me just five minutes panic, and I had to wait a long time because people never stopped going by. I'm going to the cafe, Shveik. If anybody should come, tell him to wait. About an hour later, there arrived an elderly gray-haired gentleman of erect carriage and stern countenance. His whole appearance exhaled cold anger and rage. He looked as if he had been sent by fate to destroy our miserable planet and to obliterate all traces of it in the universe. His words were harsh, dry, and severe. Not at home, so he's gone to a cafe, has he? So I've got to wait, have I? Very well, I'll wait till the morning. He's got money for a cafe, but not to pay his debts. Calls himself a priest, lousy rat. He spat in the kitchen. Sir, don't spit here, said Shveik, looking at the stranger with interest. I shall spit once more, as you see, like this, said the severe gentleman obstinately, spitting on the floor a second time. He should be ashamed, an army, cha army chaplain. What a disgrace. If you've had any education, Fake reminded him, then you should have cured yourself of spitting in someone else's house. Or do you think that when there's a world war on, you can do what you please? You've got to behave decently and not like a hooligan. You've got to act politely, talk decently, and not carry on like a damned scoundrel, you bloody fool of a civilian, you. The stern gentleman got up from his chair began to shake with fury and shouted, you dare tell me I'm not a decent man? Then what am I? Tell me, you're a dirty pig, answered Shvake, looking at him straight in the eye. You spit on the floor as though you were in a tram, a train, or a public place. I've always wondered why there were notices hanging everywhere that spitting is prohibited, and now I see it's all because of you. They must know you very well everywhere. The stern man began to change color and tried to answer with a torrent of oaths directed at Shveik and the chaplain. Have you finished your speechifying, Shveik asked composedly when the gentleman had delivered himself of his last, you are both scoundrels like master like dog, or would you like to say something more before you fly down the stairs? As the stern gentleman had exhausted himself to such an extent that no valuable and effective oath came to his mind, he fell silent and Shveik took it as a sign that there was no point in waiting for anything further. And so he opened the door, placed the stern gentleman at it with his face towards the quarter and gave him a kick worthy of a shoot of the best player in an international football championship team. And behind the stern gentleman, Shveik's voice carried all the way down the steps. Next time when you visit decent people, see you behave decently. The stern gentleman walked for a long time up and down underneath the windows and waited for the chaplain. Shveik opened the window and watched him. At last, the chaplain came back. He took the stern gentleman into his room and sat him down on a chair opposite him. Shveik silently brought it in a spittoon and placed it in front of the guest. What are you doing, Shveik? Humbly reports her, there's already been some unpleasantness here with this gentleman concerning spitting on the floor. Leave us alone together, Shveik. We have business to transact. Shveik saluted. Humbly reports, sir, I'm leaving you. He went into the kitchen and in the next room, a very interesting conversation took place. You've come for the money for that bill of exchange, if I am not mistaken, the chaplain asked his guest. Yes, and I hope the chaplain sighed. A man is often brought into a situation where hope is the only thing left. How beautiful is that little word hope? From that three-leafed clover which exalts man above the chaos of life, faith, hope, charity. I hope, chaplain, that the sum, of course, worthy sir, the chaplain interrupted him, allow me to repeat once more that the word hope is a great strength to man in his struggle with life. And you don't lose hope. How wonderful it is to have a definite ideal, to be an innocent, clean being, 
who lends money on bills of exchange and has a hope that he will be paid back at the right time. To hope, to hope unremittingly that I shall pay you 1,200 crowns when I haven't even 100 in my pocket. And so you, stammered the guest, yes. And so I, answered the chaplain. The guest's face again assumed an obstinate and wrathful expression. Sir, this is fraud, he said, getting up. Calm yourself, worthy sir. It's fraud, the visitor shouted obstinately. You have dis disgracefully abused my confidence. Sir, said the chaplain, a change of air will certainly do you good. It is too sultry here. Shvake, he called to the kitchen. The gentleman wants to go out in the fresh air. Humbly report, sir, came the answer from the kitchen. I've already thrown that gentleman out once. Repeat the operation, came the order, which was executed quickly, briskly, and ruthlessly. It's good, sir, that we got rid of him before he caused a scandal, said Shvake when he returned from the entrance hall. In Malashitse, there was a, once a pub keeper, a literary fellow, who always had a quotation from the Holy Bible for all occasions. And when he flogged anybody with a knout, he was always used to say, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. I'll teach you to fight in my pub. You see, Shveik, what happens to a fellow who doesn't honor priests, smiled the chaplain, St. John Chrysostom said, whoever honors a priest honors Christ. Who humiliates a priest humiliates Christ, the Lord, whose representative the priest is. We must make thorough reparations for tomorrow. Make some fried eggs and ham, bring a claret punch, and then we'll devote ourselves to meditation for, as it is said in the evening prayer, by God's mercy, all the snares of the enemy have been turned aside from this dwelling. And now I'd like to turn it to Lynn Berg, actor in St. Louis, Missouri. There are people in the world who are very obstinate and to their number belong the man who had been twice thrown out of the chaplain's apartment. Just as supper was ready, someone rang the bell. Shvake went to open the door and returned after a moment to report He's here again, sir. I've shut him up for the moment in the bathroom so we can eat our supper in peace. That's not right, Shake, said the chaplain. A guest in the house is God in the house. At banquets in the old times, they used to entertain themselves with monsters. Bring him here so that we, he can amuse us. Shake returned in a moment with the obstinate man who stared sullenly in front of him. Sit down. The chaplain invited him politely. We're just finishing our supper. We've had lobster, salmon, and now fried eggs and ham as well. We have marvelous blowouts when people lend us money. I hope that I am not here just for your amusement, said the sullen man. This is the third time I've come. I hope now that everything will be explained. Humbly report, sir observed Schweik. He's a real leech, like that fellow Bosek from Lieben. Eighteen times in one evening, they threw him out of Exner's, and he always came back saying he'd forgotten his pipe. He crept in through the window, through the door, from the kitchen, over the wall, into the saloon, through the cellar to the bar, and he would have come down the chimney if the firemen hadn't pulled him down from the roof. He was so persistent that he would have made a good minister or parliamentary deputy. They did for him what they could. The obstinate man, as though take, taking no notice of what was being said, repeated stubbornly, I want to have this matter cleared up and I demand a hearing. That's granted to you, said the chaplain. Speak worthy, sir. Speak as long as you like, and we, and we shall, meanwhile, continue our feast. I hope it won't disturb your story. Shvek, bring in the food. As you well know, said the obstinate man, a war is raging. I lent you the sum before the war, and if there had not been a war, I should not have insisted on the repayment 
but I have had unfortunate experiences. He took a notebook from his pocket and continued. I have it all recorded here. Lieutenant Janata owed me 700 crowns and had the cheek to fall at the Battle of the Drina. Lieutenant Prashek was captured on the Russian front and owes me 2,000 crowns. Captain Vikula, owing me the same amount, got himself killed by his own soldiers at the Ruskarava. Lieutenant Mahek, taken prisoner in Serbia, owes me 1,500 crowns. There are more people like that here. One falls in the Carpathians with an unpaid bill of exchange of mine. Another gets taken prisoner. Another gets drowned in Serbia. And a fourth dies in a hospital in Hungary. Now, you can understand my fears that this war will ruin me if I'm not energetic and ruthless. You could say that you are in no direct danger, but look, he thrust his notebook under the nose of the chaplain. You see, Chaplain Matias at Birno died in an isolation hospital a week ago. I could have torn my hair out. He owed me 1,800 crowns and went into a cholera ward to administer extreme unction to a man who meant nothing to him. That was his duty, my dear sir, said the chaplain. I'm going to administer extreme unction tomorrow, too. And in a cholera ward, too, observed Schweik. You can go with us so that you can see what it means to sacrifice oneself. Chaplain, said the old, the obstinate man. Believe me, I am in a desperate situation. Is this war being waged to put out of the way all who owe me money? When they call you up and you go to the front, observed Schweik again, the chaplain and I will celebrate holy mass so that it may please God in heaven that the first shell shall tear you to pieces. Sir, this is a serious matter, the leech said to the chaplain. I request that your servant should not intervene in our business so that we can settle it at once. Just as you wish, sir, replied Sheik. So be so good as to order me specifically not to interfere in your affairs. Otherwise, I shall continue to defend your interests as it befits a decent soldier. This gentleman is quite right. He wants to go away from here alone. I don't like scenes either. I'm a social man. Sheik, I'm getting bored with this said the chaplain as though he did not notice the presence of his guest. I thought this chap would amuse us, tell us some stories, and instead he asks me to order you not to interfere, although you've had to deal with him twice already. On an evening like this, when I have in front of me such an important religious right, when I have to turn all my thoughts to God, he bothers me with a stupid story about a wretched 1,200 crowns, distracts me from searching my conscience and from God and wants me to tell him once more that I'm not going to give him anything at the moment. I don't want to speak to him any longer so that this holy evening is not ruined. You say to him, Spake, the chaplain is not going to give you anything. Shvek discharged the order, falling it into the guest's ear. The obstinate guest continued to sit there, however. Shvek suggested the chaplain, ask him how long he intends to sit gaping here. I won't move from here until I get my money, the leech retorted obstinately. The chaplain got up, went to the window and said, in that case, I give him over to you, Shvek. Do with him what you like. Come here, sir, said Shvek, seizing the unwelcome guest by the shoulder. Third time lucky. And he repeated his performance quickly and elegantly while the chaplain drummed a funeral march on the window. The evening, which was devoted to meditation, passed through several phases. The chaplain grew closer to God, with such piety and ardor 
that at, the, at midnight, the following strains could be heard from his apartment. When we marched away, the girls all cried their eyes out, and the good soldier spake, sang with him. And now I turn the story over to Mick O'Brien in New York City. In the military hospital, two men were longing for extreme unction, an old major and a bank manager who was an officer in the reserves. Both had got bullets in the stomach in the Carpathians and lay in adjoining beds. The officer in the reserve considered it his duty to have extreme unction administered to him because his superior officer was longing for it too. He regarded it as a breach of discipline not to have it. The pious major did it out of calculation, imagining that a prayer could cure an invalid. However, the night before the extreme unction, both of them died. And when in the morning, the chaplain arrived with Sheikh, both the officers lay underneath a sheet with black faces like all those who die of asphyxiation. Well, we were making such a splash, sir, and now they've gone and spoiled things, Schweig grumbled when they told him in the office that these two no longer needed anything. And it was true. They had made a great splash. They had driven there in a droshki. Schweig had rung the bell, and the chaplain had held in his hands a bottle with the oil, which was wrapped up in a table napkin. He solemnly blessed all the passers-by with it, and they took off their hats. There were not many of them, it is true, although Schweig tried to make a tremendous row with the bell. One or two innocent street urchins ran behind the droshki and one of them seated himself behind, whereupon his comrades broke out in unison, after the carriage, after the carriage. And Schweik rang the bell. The droshki driver hit backwards with his whip. In Varchkova Street, a woman concierge, who was a member of the congregation of the Virgin Mary, trotted after the droshki and caught up with it. And she received a blessing on the way, made the sign of the cross, spat and shouted, oh, they're driving like Jehu with the Lord. It's enough to give you TB. After which she returned breathlessly to her old place. It was the droshki driver's mare, which was most worried by the sound of the bell. It must have reminded her of something that had happened in the past because she continually looked behind and from time to time tried to dance on the cobbles. And so this was the great splash which Schweik talked about. In the meantime, the chaplain went into the office to settle the financial side of the extreme unction and calculated to the quartermaster sergeant major that the army authorities owed him 150 crowns for the consecrated oil and the journey. Then followed a quarrel between the commandant of the hospital and the chaplain, in the course of which the chaplain hit the table with several times with his fist and said, don't imagine, Captain, that extreme unction is gratis. When an officer in the dragoons is ordered to go to the stud farm for horses, they pay him subsistence too. I am really sorry that these two did not live to get their extreme unction. It would have been 50 crowns more. In the meantime, Schweik waited down in the guardhouse with the bottle of the holy oil, which aroused genuine interest among the soldiers. One expressed the view that this oil could be very successfully used for cleaning rifles and bayonets. A young soldier from the Bohemian Moravian Highlands who still believed in God, asked them not to talk about these things and not to bring into discussion the mysteries of the sacrament. We must, he said, live in hope like Christians. An old reservist looked at the raw recruit and said, nice hope that a shrapnel tears off your head. 
Eh, they've pulled the wool over our eyes. Once, a deputy from the clerical party came to our village and spoke to us about God's peace, which spans the earth and how the Lord did not want war and wanted us all to live in peace and get on together like brothers. And look at him now, the bloody fool. Now that war has broken out, they pray in all the churches for the success of our arms. And they talk about God like a chief of the general staff who guides and directs the war. From this military hospital, I've seen many funerals go out and cartfuls of hacked off arms and legs carried away. When the soldiers are buried naked, said another soldier, and into the uniform, they put another live man. And so it goes on forever and ever. Uh, until we've won, observed Schweck. Eh, and that bloody half-wit wants to win something, a corporal chimed in from the corner. To the front with you, to the trenches. You should be driven for all your worth onto bayonets over barbed wire, mines and mortars. Anyone can lie about behind the lines, but no one wants to fall in action. I, I think that it's splendid to get oneself run through with a bayonet, said Schweig, and also that it's not bad to get a bullet in the stomach. It's even grander when you're torn to pieces by a shell and see that your legs and belly are somehow remote from you. It's very funny, and you die before anyone can explain it to you. The young soldier gave a heartfelt sigh. He was sorry for his young life. Why was he born in such a stupid century to be butchered like an ox in a slaughterhouse? Why was all that necessary? Now a soldier who was a teacher by profession and seemed to read his thoughts observed, well, some scientists explain war by the appearance of sunspots. As soon as a sunspot like that appears, something frightful always happens. The conquest of Carthage, how to hell with your learning, the corporal interrupted him. Go and sweep the room instead. Today it's your turn. What the hell do we care about any bloody sunspots? Even if there were 20 of them, I wouldn't buy them. No sunspots are really very important, put in Schweck. Once there was a sunspot like that, and that very same day, I was beaten up at the pub at Ubanzatu at Nusu. From that time, whenever I went anywhere, I always looked at the newspapers to see if a sunspot hadn't appeared. And as soon as one did, then count me out. I said, I, I didn't go anywhere. That was the only way I managed to survive. At the time when the volcano Montpelier destroyed the entire island of Martinique, a professor wrote in the newspaper in Narodni Politka that he had long ago told readers about a big sunspot, but the newspaper didn't get to the island in time. So the people on it caught it proper. Meanwhile, upstairs in the office, the chaplain met a lady from the Association of Gentlewomen for the Religious Education of the Troops an old repulsive siren who went around the hospital from the early morning and distributed everywhere icons of saints, which the wounded and the sick soldiers threw into their spittoons. And when she went around, she infuriated everybody with her stupid chatter about their having honestly to repent their sins and really reform so that after death, God could give them everlasting salvation. She was pale. When she talked with the chaplain, she said that the war, instead of ennobling the soldiers, made beasts of them. Downstairs, the patients had stuck their tongues out at her and told her how she was a, a scarecrow and a frightful, skinny old frump. Oh, how dreadful, chaplain, she said in German. 
the people have been corrupted. And she described how she saw the religious education of a soldier. Only when he believes in God and has religious feelings can a soldier fight bravely for his imperial majesty and not fear death, because then he knows that paradise awaits him. She babbled on and said a few more stupid things like this, and it was clear that she was resolved not to let the chaplain go. But he excused himself in a rather ungallant way. We're going home, Shvek, he called to the guardhouse. And on the way back, they made no splash. Next time anyone who likes can administer extreme unction, said the chaplain. Fancy having to haggle about money for every soul you want to save. Their accounts are the only thing they think about. Seeing a bottle of the consecrated oil in Schweik's hand, he frowned. It would be better, Schweik, if you polished my boots and your own with this. I'll see if I can't oil the lock with it, added Shvek. It squeaks frightfully when you come home at night. And thus ended the extreme unction that never was. Thank you, Mick, for a great reading. Za císaře pana a jeho rodinu. Za císaře pana a jeho rodinu. Museli jsme vybojovat Hercegovinu. Za 